So, hi, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the Sunday session. My name is Steve Judge. I'm the host for Football Network World's weekly webinar with football practitioners around the world. Today I'm joined by three amazing general managers at uh, women's football clubs. In, first of all, we have Sandra Doralais from uh, PSV in Holland. We have Anna Mackinen, Director of Sport at AIK in Sweden. And I've got the general manager from the Utah Royals, Stefano Lee. Um, before I have the opportunity to introduce you to the three ladies, um, I'd just like to share with you the format we have in store for you on today's discussion. So we will be looking at managing the vision for a women's football club um, to help filter your questions through to Sandra, Stephanie and Anna. We'll be looking, going through, focusing on three different areas in the discussion. Um, we'll start at what the current situation is at each of their clubs in terms of returning to play post lockdown. Um, then each, each of them will share their, their vision for the future at their clubs and also within, within their leagues and women's football as a whole. And then sort of a deeper sort of dive into what are the challenges and pro approaches they face in their day-to-day -day roles of moving from the restart of football towards that vision they have for their clubs. So, so that we can uh, jump into there, let me start to introduce our three guests today. So we'll start with Sandra. Sandra, first of all, sort of, hello, how are you? I'm good, hi, thanks for having me. Yes, you're very welcome. I um, just wanted just to begin with, you could just share with us a bit of your football journey that sort of led you to your current role at PSV, but sort of yeah, just very much in terms of the clubs and sort of roles, positions you've had over the years. Yeah, um, it's, um, um, it's my third year as a general manager. Um, I've been um, involved in football uh, as an early age, uh, since I was seven playing football, playing in the highest leagues, uh, all the national teams and um, um, playing, got a chance to play abroad, um, in a, got a scholarship to play in the US, um, afterwards in Denmark, before I went back to Holland, um, played in the national futsal team as well, so um, um, had a, had a all right, career and uh, being a football player myself um, then went into actually uh, out of football uh, had some management uh, jobs within the youth uh, healthcare uh, youth mental health care actually um, before um, I was uh, uh, again very hungry to be involved with the women's football again so um, I quit my job and I uh, got an intern job at PSV uh, to uh, to get my uh, coaching um, degrees and um, they actually asked me to stay and uh, um, grew into several roles being an assistant coach first and then um, um, had to do the scouting uh, of the players and eventually uh, becoming uh, the general manager so i um, very happy where the position that I'm in right now. Hey, fantastic that's a quite incredible career path you've had so far both in and out of football. Yeah, it's nice. And, um, you know, also being out of football and being in, uh, in several management jobs, it really helped me to, uh, to have this job right now because you have the experience as a football player and being abroad. Also, you know, know how, how players feel when they come from abroad, coming into the country and how, how you need to feel, feel welcome in order to play well. Um, and also uh, know the different styles of play and I know how to adjust. Uh, to grow teams um, yeah, and also of course you know the, as a general manager not just about knowing the football it's also knowing uh, how to be a manager dealing with, with people being a leader of people and uh, having a vision and structure of uh, getting things done. Yeah, fantastic we'll certainly be uh, delving into each of those uh, experiences you've had and how they've helped you involve into the role you currently have. Um, so then sort of move on to Anna uh, at AIK. Anna, how are you doing? I believe you're celebrating nine straight wins at AIK. Yeah, thank you. I'm doing great. Thanks for having, having me also here. Um, yeah, I wonder, yeah, just to, to begin with, similar as with, with Sandra, just sort of to share with us your sort of your pathway in football leading to you uh, taking on your current position at AIK. 
Yeah, I also started as a player uh, when I was seven years old and uh, playing through the youth national team and the senior national team. Um, and then, um, yeah, I played some years in, in college at the University of Notre Dame in, in the States for four years. And then after that, played in the WSA, which was the first women's professional soccer league. Um, I played there in, in Washington and Philadelphia. And then moved to Sweden, actually, when our national team qualified for the, uh, for the first time for the European National Championships uh, in 2000, 2005. Uh, so I moved to Umeå which was one of the biggest or the best club teams at that time with Marta and Hanna Gunberg and all those kinds of stars in, in, in that team. Um, 2009 played in the European Championships in, in Finland and I ended the career here in AIK. In um, so, and then after my playing career, I, I started, I became part of the senior national team uh, coaching staff and then uh, moved to Finland, worked with the youth national teams, worked in the like the academy environment, developing players, and then those the last three years now with the um, women's national team in Finland in like the physical preparation and sports science uh, side of of it uh, of the coaching. And then in November last year, I started as the director of sports in AIK. So I'm, I'm quite new in this role, but I'm really enjoying it so okay. far. And obviously, yeah, interesting times to be uh, coming into a new role. Yes, it's an interesting first year with uh, the current pandemic, which is really, really making things a lot more difficult for all of us, certainly. Okay, yeah, we'll certainly be uh, looking at that in a little bit more detail soon, but uh, we'll sort of quickly then move along to, to Stephanie, bring uh, Stephanie in uh, from Utah. I believe it's still, yeah, you're on a different time zone to us all. Yes, it's starting to get a little bit light outside, so it's good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie. Um, I have been working with the NWSL since 2014. Um, this that league was created in 2013, so I've been here from pretty much the beginning. Started as an intern, uh, worked my way through the team ops and the soccer side um, to um, with the Seattle Rain um, up to be their director of operations and served in that role for a few years, um, working really closely with their, their coach at the time, Laura Harvey, um, and just kind of learning. Um, pretty much everything she was willing to teach me. And then once the um, Utah Royals franchise was um, begun in 2018, um, and she was making the transition and they were looking for a managing director, um, I was um, available. And so she kind of threw my name in the hat and suggested I take a look at the role. Um, so I applied and um, here I am. So it's been three years with the Utah Royals. Um, just moving into the official general manager role in the past nine months or so. So it's also been an interesting first year uh, for me in um, wearing that kind of title and that hat. So, okay. so within your role, I know we'll get into it a little bit deeper, but in your role, with, you've sort of obviously also still heavily involved in at league level as well, as well as club level. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> um, uh, in my role, I sit as one of the uh, board of directors um, members for the Royals, for the league, for the NWSL. So attending all the board meetings, um, and then also sitting on the competition committee um, in terms in, in weekly discussions on how our league needs to evolve and grow and adapt our rules um, to stay um, to stay in line with all those other European clubs out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a big challenge as well. Um, yeah. Certainly speak more in a moment about the challenge you've just faced with uh, putting on the tournament in the bubble. I don't know whether I'll just now bring it back to Sandra. I think, yeah, it's sort of doing this order where Sandra is probably a little bit behind in Holland in terms of uh, where they are at their restart. So Sandra, I don't know if you could share with us where exactly where PSP are in terms of coming back to the grass and, and you and your role, where is, where is your main focus at this moment in time? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we've just started pre-season. Um, our league uh, will start uh, the first week of September. Uh, so we've already started our pre-season, um, uh, allowed to, to practice freely and stuff like that. So, so that's nice. Um, you can tell, you know, we, we haven't um, been really been out since March. We had a couple of weeks in uh, end of May where we could do some stuff, but it was within one and a half meters distance. So it was hard to have the, the good drills and stuff like that. So now, um, uh, since two weeks, we've, uh, we've been outside playing, um, which is really nice. And, and um, I don't know how it was for, for you guys, but um, it was, you could tell the first week, you know, players were more sore than they were before. So it's, it's really, you have to be cautious in how you're gonna have them be involved and, and get in shape, uh, um, yeah, the way they should be in shape and be ready for the games. And um, you know, it's, it's very challenging also because uh, we were supposed to play our uh, first friendly game yesterday, uh, but it got canceled uh, um, yeah, the day before because someone else from, from the men's side, actually the first men's side who were playing at our ground, um, the opponent, someone uh, tested positive, so they decided to, to cancel all the games. And I guess that's where we're going to be at for the next uh, months. It's, it's going to be so insecure the whole time, and, and it's very challenging mentally, and not just for us as a staff uh, in organizing everything and having plan B, C, and D even, uh, but also for the players, you know, they're preparing themselves for the first game, getting ready, and you know, it's, we have a group of 23 and, and they're all really good players and it's very challenging and you really just want to focus on becoming a starter and doing well in the game. But now you also have to prepare yourself mentally. Okay, we might not play, you know, but I have to make sure that I'm ready to play. And yeah, then in the end, just, you know, a few hours before the game was played, it was canceled. And it's the whole time it's going to be like that. How is the next uh, friendly game going to be? How is the first game going to be? So it's... Uh, I find it quite challenging, just not for myself, but for the whole team. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a mental toughness that's uh, being added because of the whole situation. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that part is probably, we can come back to that as a tough situation when you have that, when you start having that uncertainty, it's hard enough to create. So you've got with Stephanie Lees, where they use that bubble without around the whole league, but then that bubble with around your own team of sort of providing that, security that they feel safe playing and then you get there and then a game gets cancelled and it's almost like a, a step back yeah and it's it's tough it's uh it's challenging i don't know how it is for for the other two ladies but uh what your experiences are but yeah i find it really challenging you see anna's taken on that challenge i mean clearly you're having an amount of success in terms of winning games um Somebody when first coming back, what were the things that you put in place to, again, create, one, create a safe environment for your players to go on and get fit and then to perform? I mean, um, in Sweden, I, I guess everybody knows that Sweden has had a little bit of a different strategy in uh, fighting against the pandemic and dealing with it. And so we've been actually able to train the whole time quite normally, uh, taking you know, uh, cons into consideration some of the or all of the restrictions but it's been and training wise we've been able to train uh, as a team and uh you know the challenge was actually during the spring where we we started our pre-season the 7th of uh, january we're supposed to get started with the season on 4th of april so that was kind of the time frame we were preparing the team for uh then the season got postponed we were we gave we were given a new date which was was it in the beginning of may or at the end of may so so we we're like okay that's the that's the next uh, kind of a goal for us to get the, the team ready when that didn't happen it was like it's been really a roller coaster mostly for the players of course so we've been really focusing on on uh, focusing on short-term goals for them you know what we can do what can we do today what can we do during this week without being able to play games how can we develop the, the team and we've been really focusing on the physical side because that's really something that we need to step up if um if or when we're taking the the step to the highest league which is the dama sense um and uh, so the focus has been there but just really to find ways to give players breaks uh like we did in the easter easter week they're off and and so on um 
but it's it's been mental mostly mentally challenging for all of us how we deal with this and how it's going to affect the whole whole club and obviously it's affecting the economy uh hugely so we've been dealing with things like going down in this, you know the salary cuts and uh, permutations i don't know if that's the right word in, in english but you know we we were not allowed to train as much as we wanted and uh to get the compensation from this from that state or, or yeah um so things like that it's been more like on the economical side um that i've been then dealing uh with um, and then uh, we got to start the season in the middle of june which was quite quite a relief for all of us uh, not the least for the players but of course the coaches have been also struggling with how to keep the focus and how to like keep developing the, the tactical side when you don't when you don't get any answers if you know you're not playing the game so we started the season without any uh, friendly games without any training games leading into the to the season so um as far as injuries we haven't really had any anything i don't think anything like connected to the start of the the um, competition uh it's been more like related to the game game like or game situations where the players have gotten hurt so we've we've gotten some injuries but those are mostly related to tackles in the game so i think we've managed quite well in that way okay it's been more contact injuries rather than muscle yeah yeah more so okay i guess it's been a big relief having the matches start that you now have some purpose to, to what you're doing i guess in football that uh, the whole purpose of everything that people do is is the match day yeah i was really if you start the 7th of january january and you've been they've been training you know play, their players start to train around december preparing themselves they take two weeks off after, after the season that ended in november then you're in full training individually so you're preparing for the collective training and then you train all the way to the middle of June, which is like no end in sight. But uh, yeah, so it's been a relief to uh, be able to like focus every week for one game or two games per week. Really gives you the purpose while you're you're playing and training and trying to develop. And also for the coaches to get the answers they need to develop the the team tactically also. Okay, fantastic. I know it's Stephanie um, at Utah. You had a similar situation where you were sort of planning or coming in to start the preseason when when the lockdown came and you sort of really had to sort of change your plans really quickly and, and fantastically as it's turned out in the last month or so. Yeah, we started preseason, I believe the league started March 9th. Um, and then March 11th is the day that uh, Rudy Gobert, who happens to be a Utah NBA player, tested positive, um, and it kind of shut the American sports world down. NBA shut down, MLS shut down, um, and so then we were we were shut down as well. So we had two full days of preseason um, before we went into a lockdown. And similar to um, Anna's situation, it was a lot of questions of what's going to happen? When do we restart? How long is this shutdown? Can I go home? Can I go see my family from the players? Uh, and the biggest struggle is just managing their mental health through it. Um, the, we can give them as many workouts as they want, as many fields to run on, but um, if they're not kicking a ball or know when they're kicking a ball, their purpose tends to be a little bit questioned, questionable for them. So um, that was the hardest part, just figuring out how to engage with them via Zoom or how to keep them focused um, and excited and ready because we had to take the mentality that we would be back eventually. Um, so we had to prepare as much as we could um, and keep them engaged. And that was probably the most challenging part. Everything kind of got put on hold. Um, any planning or changes that we were trying to do or new ideas we were trying to develop all kind of got sat on the back burner to focus on um, the players mentally and make sure that they were they were okay through all of this. So um, that was the biggest piece. Um, and then 
from my perspective, working with the board um, in discussions of what were we going to do? How are we going to figure this out? It was all so unknown um, from every perspective, not just um, sports or even this league, but I mean, how do, how do we have a society that functions? So it was such a bigger question than what we were doing, um, but we had to try and figure it out and make it fit somewhere um, so that we we all had jobs, <laughs> essentially. So um, it was actually um, kudos, huge kudos to our um, new commissioner, Lisa Baird. Um, as hard as these last six months have been for me, I can't imagine how hard they were for her because she started on March 1st, <laughs> the first day of her job, um, her new job. So she's managed through this pandemic really, really well. Um, but it was actually her pitch and her idea to do uh, an Olympic style tournament. Her background happens to be Olympics. She worked for USA Olympics for several years. Um, so that was her kind of pitch to the board. Um, and then from um, Utah's perspective, our facilities and our setup here, we kind of looked at that option and said, you know, we think we, we, think we can help out with that. So we put together a bid um, that had housing and um, facilities, fields, um, gyms, everything that we could offer um, that would help them create the bubble type atmosphere um, and keep um, players safe. So from once, I think the, the tournament plan was decided early to mid-May. Um, and then after that, it was full go to create the medical protocols, the housing protocols, um, the rules of being in the bubble. You know, players want to know, can I go get a coffee? Um, can I go on a hike? No, none of those things were able to happen. So um, the planning from there all kind of just took up took off and it was nonstop um, and huge kudos to NWSL and the rest of the Royals and RSL organization for pulling it off because everybody worked really, really hard. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I don't know whether Anna and Sandra probably want to jump in and ask a few questions around that, but um, I think one that probably jumps out that once you sort of decided that this was the way you were going to go, um, I don't think buy-in is the right word with the players because I think they were on board, but Again, sort of a case of you, I suppose, is it easier maybe for yourselves that as a team, you were still going to be in familiar surroundings? Yeah, no, there definitely was buy-in needed <laughs> from players. Um, the league had to do a lot of work with the NWSLPA and then the U.S. Women's National Team, CBA. Um, and their buy-in was mostly from are we going to be safe? Like, can you create an environment that we're going to be safe in? Um, it, and, and that was the biggest, the biggest concern from the players um, with everything going on in the world. Um, and then um, from the Royals perspective, there was conversation back and forth between the league and the medical task force of if Royals would need to move into a hotel to fully be in the bubble. Um, ultimately, they did allow us to stay in our homes, which I do think um, helped them, but it wasn't, they still had to follow the protocol. You know, they weren't allowed to go to the grocery store. They weren't allowed to go get a coffee. They were allowed to drive from the stadium to home, and that was it. All of the Royals live in the same apartment complex, so they even had to utilize vans that the league provided so they could only come and go as a group. Um, so it, it, it was easier that they had their home that, um, that they could stay in, but they still um, were required to follow all the rules. We all were. I couldn't go to the grocery store for six weeks, so <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting time, but you figured it out and you dealt with it and you were so busy with work and preparing. Um, I'm sure everyone's been in a tournament type setting where within four, 17 days you have four games all you're really doing is preparing for the next game and then recovering and then preparing for the next game. So um, it, it went by fast, but um, it was worth it. Stephanie, I have a question uh, about the economical side of like the consequences of the pandemic. How, how have you guys still dealt with that? And, you know. Yeah, I think that 
from um, an organizational perspective, um, it's um, definitely taken a hit on um, our side um, and the men's side being a club um, that's tied to a men's team. That is obviously where um, the money comes, the large pieces of revenue for our organization comes. So um, there's been shifts and adjustments um, to make things work from a staffing perspective, kind of a lowering furloughing staff trying to get as um to a place where uh, the losses are at a minimum um but while still being able to function and to be able to have a season because everybody is hoping to have a season but from a royals financial perspective um, um with sponsorships the the tournament helped us fulfill everything that we needed to fulfill so that was a huge piece um, for all teams being able to kind of get those make goods for their sponsors taken care of. Obviously, we didn't have fans, so there weren't any ticket revenue opportunities, but um, from a sponsorship perspective, it helped us at least fulfill the payments that we had received. Now, looking to 2021, there's going to have to be some serious conversations amongst the ownership groups and players about fans and how to move forward because from um, a Royals perspective and in the U.S., the women's um, game, the largest revenue piece is fans and uh, butts and seats. So um, we have to figure out how to safely have fans both for their sake and the players' sake. Um, I think that that's going to be the biggest challenge moving forward uh, for, for the NWSL. Interesting. I think we're dealing with, you know, we're more dealing with, uh, or most of our revenue comes from the sponsors, uh, so far at least. So that's really where my focus or, and our focus is going to be. But of course the fan, you know, and strategy is going to be more and more important to us. Of course, then we'll see what this, how this pandemic uh, affects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for us, um, sponsorship is big as well. Um, but most of, for the Royals, most of our sponsors are local. So their biggest um, asset value is the fans in the seats. So if they, if their product and their name is not being seen by the people at the games, um, they're not as happy. So it, it's, it's a twofold, it's a twofold issue for us. How has the Googles, uh, you know, they came in during the spring, right? As a, yeah. So they came the biggest in. Partners. Yeah, they joined as a, as a league sponsor um, specifically for the Challenge Cup. Um, we had a few come in. P&G came in, which um, is, a, is a household product uh, company. They've got Secret. They've got a bunch of other um, products. And then um, there was one more. Oh, Budweiser came in. They were the, the three big sponsors for the tournament. Um, we had a previous relationship with Budweiser, um, but P&G and Google were new for um, the league for the tournament. And um, they were super, super happy with everything that went on and were really hoping to be able to turn those into long-term partnerships. That sounds great. What, yeah. what, be, be, before the pandemic, how, how big is your support, like locally, fan base, and you know, how many people show up to the game. Yeah, we were averaging between um, nine and 12,000 per game uh, um, in the stands. Um, we would get up to 15 or 17 if a, if a Portland or an Orlando was in town with some of their big stars. Um, so um, that, that, was our, that was our average uh, ticket draw. That's really good. Yeah, at least yeah. from my perspective. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're um, we usually in 2019 we were we would go back and forth between second and third in the league in um, fan attendance. Portland um, sets the bar pretty high, with an average of 19 to 20 thousand. So you, I, my guess is that you really worked uh, hard for the fan, to have a fan strategy, and you know, like how you recruit people to. To the games and <laughs> yeah that yeah our ticketing department does a great job um of kind of reaching out individually to our fan base whether it's season ticket holders or um youth clubs or um community outreach but um they have they have a strong network that they that they that they do a lot of work to get those so do you use the same personnel as the men's team or do you have your own doing you do them actually 
We do actually, that's one of the benefits of um, being so closely tied to our MLS team um, is so the Royals technical staff and myself are all individual, um, but then any, anyone on the business side is, is shared. So sponsorship, ticketing, content, social media creation, they're all um, equally distributed between the men's and the women's. Great. Okay. Seems like we're we moving in a direction where it could be sort of now get you on to your, your own individual visions. Although I don't know whether Sandra, you would sort of wanted to quickly jump in with a, a quick point on that. No. So in that case, Sandra, I'll let you uh, take uh, center stage and sort of share with us your, your vision at, at PSV. It's um, just, just to, to add on the discussion just now, I think it's really interesting what, uh, what you've pulled off, you know, in the US, uh, being able to create this bubble without any positive testing. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's extremely well done uh, to get this accomplished. So uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's just the example of how we should do things. And also I think with the players and the staff and, and everyone involved being so, um, how you say uh, well well maintained you know that you weren't uh, and responsible so you didn't test positive i think it's uh, yes but it was very impressive that that you pulled it off so uh, congrats on that one actually um i was going to ask some question about testing because you know it's how far do you go with testing and stuff like that but uh, um that's, that's maybe for another time um i don't know we can certainly jump back into that because yeah i think it's also interesting yeah with that angle that you've had games postponed so yeah, we'll certainly it, jump into that before the end of today. And of course, yeah, because, you know, it's creating a bubble for, for a month or six weeks, you know, because uh, I've also heard um, from the players that actually played in, the, in this Challenge Cup uh, that they were saying, you know, it was, it was great and it was so well organized, uh, but it was, it was really tough because all you could literally do was stay in your hotel and then either practice or have a game and then you had to go back and you couldn't do anything so it was again mentally challenging uh, to pull it off so it's there's only a certain time space that you can actually do this because otherwise you know you will go crazy it's it's not for a whole season yeah um, and that that you know it's it's you want to create this bubble that's that's when you can pull it off but you know we're, we're very in the search of how can we pull this off as well and and make sure that our players and staff are, uh, you know, being tested negative the whole time, and uh, um, but still have this done the whole season. And yeah, do do we have to even test our our kitchen staff or you know whoever is is coming to our facilities? We have so many people come there day in day out that it's impossible to test everyone. So yeah, we're very much in the search of how do you create this safe environment? And uh, yeah, it's it's really challenging. I don't know if you want to add on that one, Stephanie. Yeah, no, sure. I can. I can definitely. It was. I, I would totally agree with the players that the probably the hardest part was go. You go to training in the morning, and then you have another six to eight hours to fill your day, and it's at the hotel. Um, we did. We tried to do as much as we could. We brought in games, and we brought in um, like some teams brought in TV screens, and they would do movie movie viewings. But it's still, it's still the same place. You're still looking at the same people um, in the same location every day. So um, there was gonna be some um, kind of droning on for sure. Um, but to your point, huge kudos to them that they that they stuck through it and they um, got through with no with no positive tests. So. Um, from a testing perspective, uh, we worked really, really closely with um, all of our team doctors to create a really comprehensive medical protocol. Um, and it during the preseason time frame, so that while we were training the end of May through till the tournament started, it was weekly tests. Um, and so um, there, that protocol. Um, did not provide the players or any staff with rules of where to go or what to do. So it was up to the individual and team to enforce, um, you know, wear your mask, don't go do this, do go, you can go to the grocery store, but don't go do this, don't go to restaurants, whatever it might be. Um, in Utah at the time, um, it was not, um, we were not a high state with a lot of cases. So we just um, encouraged players to wear their masks, go out as little as possible. 
um, and and they they were fine with that. They kind of held on to it, um, held on to those rules. And then once the tournament started, um, the big distinction between um, of who got tested versus who didn't was the medical task force definition of an essential employee versus a non-essential employee. An essential employee was someone that would have immediate and daily interaction with the players. So coaches, um, some of the facility staff, depending on if they, where they went and what they did. Um, and so they were tested weekly as well as three days before a game. Um, just to make sure just that that double um, that kind of double assurance there. So we've we've had multiple multiple tests <laughs> throughout this process. Um, and then as an organization, and um, this is just part of, um, I think, the new normal for us um, here and as we manage through this pandemic is if you, for that non-essential employee bucket, it was a daily temperature screen and symptom check before you arrived at work. So before you even got in the door, you had to have your temperature, your temporal um, scan and answer questions about um, symptoms or where you'd been. So that was that just that added kind of flag of do we have anyone trying to come to work that has any indication of symptoms. Um, so that was, that's been the other piece. Um, and then the contract tracing was also um, a really big important step. Um, it, and we ended up luckily not having to worry about it because we had no positive tests, but knowing the processes of what, you, what happens um, if there is any positive tests and who you have to contact was, um, was a, big, a big piece to plan out as well. Yeah, and you have to take this into consideration, you know, if you do have one positive test uh, among the players or staff, uh, when you're going to cancel, when not, yeah, it's uh, luckily yeah, that, we, that it happened. Yeah, we had, I mean, we had that come up the, the day before teams are starting to arrive, right, with Orlando um, and their um, numerous positive tests and them having to make a decision as a team whether they continue to try and come to the tournament or not so from the beginning we had we had we were kept on our toes <laughs> so um, the our there were a couple times where the commissioner would just calmly say like we have protocols and this is why you create the protocols in advance and so let's see what the protocol says and just follow follow the protocol because if it's written down in a step-like manner and you just follow the steps, um, then it, when it becomes emotional and people are stressed and worried, you're just following the steps and you're not having to think about what to do. So um, they, were, they were helpful in many regards from the protocols. Yeah, totally agree. I think that's a uh, key to this, to, to make protocols. And you know, it's fine if you adjust along the way with the insights that you're having, but you need to have them uh, written down and uh, make sure that everyone's following them. Totally agree with that. 